Um, Genesis 16. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to grab one. We've got Bibles in the back. There's a couple up here. If you don't have a Bible, take that one with you. We believe that this is the greatest book that you could ever own. And uh, we want to make sure that you have a copy of it. And um, we're going to be circling some words. We're going to be underlining some words. And so if you don't have a Bible, please take this take this with you. It is our gift to you. Um, so excited that you guys are here today. Lots of places that you could have been and you decided to come and make it to church today. And so we're proud of you. Um, I will tell you that this chapter that we have out ahead of us today, Genesis 16, I thought we were going to kind of scoot right on over. Um, last week, I was thinking we were actually going to cover like 16, 17, maybe 18, even 19 today. And, and I will tell you that I, I absolutely, I, 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 I could not stop reading Genesis 16 this week. Um, I think it is an incredible chapter of the Bible. We're going to spend today's, uh, we're just going to work through it today. I will tell you it is one of the most uncomfortable chapters in the Bible that I've read. I've wrestled with the Lord about this chapter. But it is also, I think, just a clear picture of God's love to us. And so we're going we're gonna to really spend some time in Genesis 16. Um, but I will tell you that I'm going to guess that parts of today's study are going to make you uncomfortable. And the reason why I say that is once we get there, I just want you to know I told you so. Right? And, and, and don't feel like you're out of place if this chapter makes you uncomfortable because it made me uncomfortable. And um, what, I, what I love about the Bible is that you can learn about Jesus in Genesis 16 just as much as you can learn about Jesus in John chapter 3. And that's why I love the Word of God. That's why I love that when we, when we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, you never know what the Lord has in store for you. And Genesis 16 is just one of those chapters where you just go, man, I'm so glad that it's there. It is a tough read, but I am so glad that it's there. And so let's turn, turn, our, um, turn our attention to there, Genesis 16. Let me ask the Lord to bless our time. <clears throat> let's go to our Heavenly Father. Father in Heaven, we are thankful to be here today, to be gathered in Your name, to be around Your people, and to get ready to dig into Your Word. God, we, it is just so amazing how we can go through any chapter of the Bible and we can hear from you. We can go through any verse and we can learn about you. You've got something for us in Leviticus. You've got something for us in Psalms. You've got something for us in Genesis or in Revelation. And you, you definitely have something for us in Genesis 16. And so God, we're thankful for your full counsel of the word of God. We're thankful that we have a guide for how to do life. We're thankful that we don't have to guess who you are. We can just open up your word and learn about you. And so God, I pray for this chapter that you have out ahead of us today. I pray that we would have ears to hear what it is that you have to say. Guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of today's message is God-sized problems call for God-sized solutions. God-sized problems call for God-sized solutions. We're going to slow down and take Genesis 16 and uh, just a really neat chapter that's out ahead of us. But it's interesting, right? Last week was, was kind of a mountaintop chapter for us and for Abram. It was really neat how we got to read about God's covenant and His promises to Abram. And today, we go all the way down into a, a, a very dark and deep low for Abram. Abram, uh, again, if we're kind of catching back up on the last couple weeks, God has called Abram to leave his father, to leave his land, and to go out into a land that God is going to give to him. He has assured him of promises, and Abram has had questions for God. What is this going to look like? How is this going to happen? You're going to give me these things. You're going to be my shield. That's wonderful, but like, how am I going to practically hand this down? My wife and I are barren. We can't have kids. And the Lord came to Abram and said, practically, you're going to have children. You're going to have a son. I'm going to make your nation, I'm going to make out of you a nation, a family. I'm going to make your name great. 
Like practical, practical, practical stuff. And last week we went away and it was just awesome, right? If you're Abram, you're, yes, God's covenant with his people. He's faithful and he's true and it was awesome. But where we pick it up today is that Abram is worn out. He's now in his, you know, his 80s. Okay, and so understandably, if you're in your 80s and God has told you that you and your wife are going to have a child, what are you thinking? Listen, changing diapers is hard in your 20s. Even if I was 50, that'd be difficult. But like I'm, I'm pushing 90 and my bride, you can understand where they're at, right? They've got a God-sized problem. And if you pick it up in, in chapter 16, verse 1, it's right out in front of us. Now Sarai, Abram's wife. Now remember, Ab- Abraham is going to be renamed. Abram is going to be renamed Abraham next week. Sarai is going to be renamed Sarah next week. But until then, we're going to call them by what you know their old names, Sarai and Abram. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Let's pause right there. So we've got a big problem. A God-sized problem. What's the problem? They can't get pregnant. Now you go, well, what's the big deal? Now typically, if you say what's the big deal, it's typically a guy that says it. Right? Because we, you know, we look on it and we think, well, well what's the big deal? You, know, you got me. That's not the way that it is for ladies. The scriptures tell us so. In Proverbs, it says there are three things that are never satisfied, four that are never enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth is not satisfied with water, and the fire never says enough. So out of the four things that are never satisfied, the Lord says a woman that cannot get pregnant. That's what it is for a woman. It's, it's, it's this, this thing that the Lord has given to women biologically where they, they have this, 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 this hunger to have children. And so, guys, if, if you're in the room and you go, I don't know what the big deal is, just understand that it's a lot bigger deal for ladies than it is for us. Biologically, at this point, Sarah has got a, a, an issue. She cannot do something that her, bo- bo- her body biologically was made to do. This is one of the hardest things in life. When, it, when, it, when a couple wants to be able to have a child and they're not able to, it's, it's heartbreaking to walk through. Because it's a good thing that they want. It's a, it's, it, it, it's a thing that the Lord has said that we should do. And so we, we look on and, 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 and Sarah, we, we have compassion for her, right? Because she's not able to do something that not only is she biologically created to do, but the Lord said to her, you will do. Spiritually, God made Abram a promise that he would have a family and a nation. God said that you're going to have a child. But at this point, they're having trouble believing it. Now, relationally, I I don't know what their relationship is like at this point. But my guess is that things are not very good. And that's what tends to happen, you know, whenever there's trouble with with not being able to get pregnant, is that sometimes the husband and the wife can, can take it out on each other. And I would imagine at this point, relationally, Abram and Sarah are struggling. The thing is, we, looking back, we know that God has them right where he wants them. They're not doing anything wrong. She's probably pacing around going, well, maybe it's my, my diet. Maybe it's my this. Maybe it's my that. Maybe it's my family that it got passed down to me, right? She's probably coming up with all of these different things. But they are right where the Lord wants them to be. Abram is probably thinking, well, you, know, you told me, but, and, and, um, but I mean, we've been trying. I mean, we, we've been trying. But we... What is it? You know, he's probably pacing around thinking, and this is a long time that he's been dealing with this. So just imagine how their relationship is getting with the Lord. Have you ever been there? To the point of where you go, Lord, I know that you said this, but I just, I'm not sure that I believe you. I'm not sure that I'm, maybe I missed the memo. 
because I, I feel so disconnected and I feel so lost. It's interesting because us looking back at Abram and Sarai, we know that God has them exactly where they're supposed to be and all they have to do is wait. Sarah and Abram have a God-sized problem that is going to call for a God-sized solution. Let's move on. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Don't read anything else. Just pause for a minute. Don't read ahead. Let's just, let's just try to guess what happens next. All right. Before we get there, let's break this down. Let's call it what it is. It's weird, right? Okay, so, so this was normal at that time. If you couldn't get pregnant after a time, they would have servants that they would then offer up to basically mother your children so that you could pass on your family legacy to. <clears throat> Unfortunately, societies have adopted really awful norms, practices, and laws that at times people use. But when we look back now, we can see how sinful they are. A lot of the commentators that I read said this isn't really a big deal. This was something that was totally acceptable at the time. And I've got to tell you, I look back at that and I go, I don't care. Right? Let's just call it what it is. It's wrong. Has anybody else ever read the Bible and go, why were these dudes marrying all these ladies? It was wrong. It was absolutely wrong. God has already laid out for us in the book of Genesis what marriage is. It is a union between a man and a woman that come together and they make one unit. And we talked about how Jesus talks about you, 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 you can't rip these things apart. It's, 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 it's just... And now we've brought in a third, right? And so, so, so can we just guess how this happened, right? Probably some guy, you know, his, his wife couldn't, couldn't have kids and he started coming up with a scheme, you know, probably. Like, well, if we, if we, I mean, we never, let's just bring in another wife. Let's bring in somebody else and we can, how did that start? How did that first conversation happen? Listen, honey, I know we've been trying for a while, but why don't we, it's wrong. I, I understand that it's a social norm, but it's wrong. One of the things that it tells me is that even if everybody says that it's okay, even if a law says that it's okay, it doesn't mean that the Lord can bless it. There are so many laws in our country right now that a lot of people say they're right, and the United States says it's right, but God cannot bless. It doesn't make it right. And we can't look on and go, well, just because everybody else is doing, we're just going to go along with it. Because as we go through scripture, we realize that God doesn't do things like that. So we continuously have to look at, can the Lord bless this? <clears throat> this is a move, understandably, that is just feeding the flesh, right? Sarai is frustrated. She's looking on and thinking, well, I can't give my husband whatever, you know, what he wants. And so... Let's solve a problem. Let's solve a problem. <clears throat> Guys, different times we're going to have to ask ourselves, like it talks about in Paul's letter to Timothy, does this move, move feed my flesh or feed my love of God? Because all the time we're going to try to rationalize things to make it right for us, right? And a good question for us to ask is, does this feed my flesh or does this feed my love of God? Because at this point, what is it doing for Sarai? Is it feeding her flesh or her love of God? This is flesh, right? This is, this is a fleshly move. So let's break, let's break this down a little bit. Who is this character Hagar? Okay, First off, you could write next to her, her name means flight. You're going to realize why she has that name here in a minute. It's interesting because we, you know, oftentimes we find meaning of words, but when we're this far back in the beginning, we get to find like the root of why people have different names. Her name is Flight. 
Okay, so, so what does the scriptures tell us? Let's go back to, to verse 1 here. You could underline that she's an Egyptian maidservant. Egyptian maidservant? What does that mean? How did she come into this crew? How did they get to Egypt? You remember? Right, there was a drought. The Lord had taken them out into the wilderness. There was a drought. They got worried, and Abram took them to Egypt. As he was going to Egypt, he said to his beautiful wife, Listen, I need you to act like my sister. They're going to try to kill me if they know that you're my wife. Remember that whole debacle with Abram? Pharaoh found out, said, Why did you do this to me? I almost married your wife. And send him away rich. Well, it seems that he also sent her away, sent him away with a woman named Hagar. Why did Abram go to Egypt? Because he made a fleshly decision. And as the great theologian Garth Brooks says in his song, The Thunder Rolls, Abram was heading back from somewhere that he never should have been. Abram, Hagar never should have been in this story. Our decisions, gang, have consequences. And Hagar is fruit of a very bad decision by Abram. <clears throat> I want to go re back and reference what the Lord has already laid out for us in Genesis chapter 2. It is Abram's job to lead in the marriage. I remember when Eve had fallen into sin, when God called this couple to give accountability, who did he call? Adam. He said, Adam, where are you? As we, as we went through in our study on marriage in Genesis, Genesis 2, remember, it is the husband's job to lead the household. It is also the husband's job and responsibility for the successes and failures in a family. And so this is on Abram. It is Abram's job to lead in their marriage. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. It's the husband's job to plant the vision for the family. He's the one that says, this is where we're headed, gang. And so this is on Abram. It's the husband's job to be responsible for the failures and successes. It was on Abram to pour into his wife. The health of their marriage is a direct reflection of his leadership. At this point, a choice is brought to him. And let me ask all of the guys in, this, in the room. If your wife came to you and said, I'd like you to have sex with this woman, what would you say? What does this tell you about where Sarai is? She's struggling, right? She's struggling with her faith. She's, she's given half-truths. She says, the Lord has restrained me. That's true. She's actually got that right. She is barren right now because the Lord has said so. He's got her right where she wants. And actually, that's true. The only problem is she follows it up with, I think that you should go into my maidservant, Sarai, or Hagar. Sarah's struggling with her walk. In essence, what is she saying? She's, a, she's essentially saying, God, you're not able to keep your promise. Let's make this happen on its own. Come on, let's do something. Let's speed this up. Let's get this plan going. You said that you were going to do this for me. I don't see it happening. And so here we go. Who here has ever done that in their walk with the Lord? God, I know that you told me this. I don't see it happening yet. So you know what? I'm just going to start taking walks of faith. And really, they're walks of flesh. We've got to be really careful not to try to make fleshly steps, to make things happen on our own. We also need to be really careful not to pull God into our half-truths. You hear it all the time, don't you? We love to use half-truths and pull God into our mess. You hear couples 
Young couples typically say, you know, I know it's God's will for us to get married, but the Bible doesn't really say anything about getting moving in together. I notice how you said it's God's will for you guys to get married, but then you're challenging things that he's put in place. Or another one that you'll hear is, you know, God created me with this Irish temper. I don't know what you think. We all have our flaws. Really? You think that God gave that to you? And typically that's what we do, right? We find a little bit, and we bring the Lord in, and then we give this bogus response. We've got to be careful of that. Don't pull God into your mess like that, like Sarai did. <clears throat> what else do we see here about Sarai? She's frustrated with her body. We also see that she wants to solve the problem. We also know that she is struggling with the effects of Eve's sin. She's trying to control her husband. Remember, that is what the Lord said that one of Eve's consequences would be. That she would try to roll over her husband. Right? This promise was given to her husband. You are going to have children. And it's going to be a child of yours. And now she's trying to roll over that. How many times do we struggle with things like this? Happens all the time. Now without reading ahead, I want you to think about what should Abram do at this point? If you were in his shoes, what would you do? What do you think she needs? How do you think she's doing mentally? How do you think that she is looking on at her life at this point? What does she need reassured of? What could Sarai's husband do to bring her comfort, peace, and patience? What could she, he be praying over her at this point? What would you say to her? All right, let's read ahead. Let's see what Abram goes with. What plan of action does he go with? It says, and Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. No! Who heeded the voice of his wife? Abram. Who listened to a bad plan? Abram. Who did not defend his wife, his marriage, and his ministry from the attack of the enemy? Abram. Abram failed to see his wife's hurts, his, her needs, and he gives into a fleshly plan and passively stands by. Remember in the garden, Satan's strategy wasn't to go after Adam. It was to go after Eve that would then take down Adam. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For God made Adam first, and afterwards he made Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived, and sin was the result. So it's a strategy of Satan to take down couples by going after the wife first, and then going after the husband. And so we've got to be careful of it. And husbands, our job is to recognize these things. It is our responsibility, and we can't just do what Adam did. Lord, it was the woman that you gave me. That's not how it goes. It is our responsibility to lead our family. It is our responsibility to understand the mental and the spiritual state of the members of our family. Let's keep going. Verse 3. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And Abram had dwelt, dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Let's pause right there for a minute. I find these verses really interesting. Do you notice the manipulation of wording in there? Let me go back and read that to you again. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He okay, said, so do, do you notice what they call her there? Okay, so here's how we're going to do it. We're going to make you, we're going to do an actual, we'll do, we'll make you a wife so that this can actually happen. 
But then what does he call her later? Mistress. It says that she gave her to him to be his wife. Who is his wife? Sarai. Can she have can he have two? No. Isn't that just like us to try to paint a, a better picture? Using marketing and PR to try to make the situation better? You ever notice today that people people typically don't uh, label adultery as adultery? We typically use another phrase, right? An affair. Because an affair sounds better, right? It kind of sounds intriguing. Or entanglement. That's now kind of a phrase that's being used. It's an entanglement. Isn't that interesting how we can use different phrases to try to paint a better picture? When our country talks about abortion, what do they call a baby? A fetus. Let's just change the phrase so that it doesn't have the type of impact. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a clump of cells. We would never do that to a baby, but a clump of cells, that's no problem. Do you notice how sometimes we can do things with words to try to make our behavior rationalized? Marketing does that, but marketing does not make it right. It's manipulation. It's not right. It says, so he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she, that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Now, isn't it just interesting how this stuff happens? You ever wonder how just sinful behavior can so quickly gain fruit? They've been barren for how long now? He goes and has sex with another woman and conceived just like that. Does anybody else wonder, like, why didn't they have trouble? Like, why, why didn't the Lord just, just pause that too? It's interesting how things happen. Then it says that she became despised in her eyes. Did anybody see that coming from a mile away? Hagar gets a little cocky. Look who got pregnant on my... This quick. She starts looking on at Sarai. It's not that hard. Did anybody see that coming? Did it, could anybody have guessed that this would turn out bad? So now Sarai is now mad. And now they've got problems. When you make decisions in your flesh, expect fleshly outcomes. We all want to get to the place of God's blessing, but often we don't do what it takes to get there. For Abram to have a blessed marriage, he would need to do the work to get there. But here, he makes a fleshly decision, and thousands of years later, his family and us are still paying the cost. Isn't that wild? We're going to get into that in a minute, but do you see how long-suffering the Lord is? Isn't it wild how he deals with people? Okay, let's go verse 5. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. Whew. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord's judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. Well, let's pause right there for a minute. Did anybody ever just stop making sense when you get in an argument? Am I the only one? This doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? She's now looking at him and saying, my wrong be upon you, husband. Can you see how passive Abram is? What? You told me to. Ah, wait, she's mad at you? Fine. Do with her what you want. He just leaves her to fend for herself, right? What do we notice more about Sarai at this point? My wrong be upon you. 
you know that your heart's in a pretty difficult place when you start saying things like that. Because we serve a God, Jesus, who does the opposite. He says, you're wrong, be upon me. And we as Christians, what have we been talking about? That love covers a multitude of sins. Her spiritual state here is a wreck. She came up with this plan and now she is saying, it's on you, man. You didn't handle this right. And now look at the position that we're in. <clears throat> she then says, the Lord judge between you and me. The last thing that she should want at this point is the Lord's judgment, right? You don't want the Lord telling you what's going on. <laughs> you don't want the Lord telling you what you just did. But she is in a state where she is an absolute wreck. Verse 6, I find just intriguing. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. This guy's in cruise control, right? No vision. Passive. Not leading courageously. He let another woman come in between his marriage. Now there's another woman in between his marriage that's pregnant. And now he's trying to sort out how to deal with it. And he just says to his wife, just take care of it. You do whatever you want. His family is getting absolutely attacked. And he just sits passively by. It's one thing to make a bad decision. It's another to make a bad decision to fix a bad decision. And that's exactly what he does here. Do with her what you want. Your plan. Passive. Let's keep going. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Okay, let's pause right there for a minute. I just want you to just chew on that for a minute. So Hagar, this woman, she was a, a, a maidservant in Egypt. This guy comes in, tells his wife to act like his sister so that he doesn't get killed. The Lord confronts Pharaoh about it. Pharaoh, instead of rebuking the guy, basically gives him a whole bunch of things because the Lord was with him. And says, you're going to go with them. You're a piece of property. You're like a cow or a chicken. And you're just sent off as a possession. So you now go with these folks. And the, and the Lord is with these folks, right? They're talking about covenants and blessings and nations. And this is going to be... And, and we know last week it said the Lord accounted to him for righteousness. One of the greatest phrases in the Bible was already used for this group. Now, if the Lord had said that to you, what are you going around saying to people? I don't know if you know this, but the Lord had accounted to me for righteousness. Who's righteous? I'm righteous. <laughs> I can only imagine what those conversations were like. And now, the people that do this, they, can't, they say, come on in. I want, you to, I, want you to go into, I want you to go into our bedroom. What? And so you do as you're told. You have sex with this guy, Abram, because his wife told you to. You get pregnant. You can't have any joy. She starts treating you terrible. And you go, fine, I'm out of here. I'm heading back to Egypt. That's exactly where we are. Now, I just want you to imagine. Again, don't read ahead yet. What do you guys think comes next? I want you to guess how, if Hagar was a part of our society, how would we guide her with wisdom? We have a single mom or a single woman who is pregnant from a, from a guy that is godly. She's a servant that is stuck and pregnant and alone. How do you think our country would advise her? Go to Planned Parenthood of Canaan, right? Take care of it. We want the quick fix in our country, don't we? 
That's what we always push ladies to do. Just make it, take, get it taken care of. I think that it is absolutely incredible what we're about to read next. Because you get to see the wisdom of God on how he handles a situation like this. And I want you to notice that the opposite of what we typically would do in the United States is it's the opposite of what God would do. If you were Abram, what would you say to Hagar? If you were Sarai, what would you say? If you were just a friend that was counseling her, what would you say? What would our church say to a person that's in a situation like that? She's pregnant from a really funky situation. She's single and she comes into the doors. Listen, this is what I'm dealing with. What would we say to her? How would we approach her? There is so much to learn between with what comes next. Watch this. Verse 7. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. Let's pause right there for a minute. For a minute. This phrase, angel of the Lord, is the first time this phrase is used in the Bible. Now, if you'll notice, the A is capital. At different times, we'll see angel of the Lord with a lowercase a. Angel means messenger. But there's different times in the Old Testament where that A is capitalized. We'll see here in this chapter that this is God talking. So who is this right here? This is Jesus. This is Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. What we talked about last week as a Christophany. Jesus meets Hagar and sits down with her to have a drink as she is running away, going back to Egypt. Now, isn't it incredible that the very first phrase of angel of the Lord, of Jesus Christ showing up in the Old Testament, is with a single pregnant woman. That is the type of God that we follow. Isn't that incredible? Doesn't it remind you of the woman at the well? Jesus just goes out of his way for people. And it is the people that we typically wouldn't say that he'd want to hang out with. Let's move on to verse 8. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? Notice that Jesus doesn't call Hagar Abram's wife. So you know that he's not blessing that whole half truth God doesn't bless us marrying multiple people sometimes people will bring that up you know about the Old Testament when they want to try to trip up a Christian well how do you guys deal with you know people being married to multiple people in the Old Testament same way that I deal with all the other sin in the Old Testament it's wrong God, it's not like God said this is the way I want you to do it he all throughout scripture talks about that that's the opposite <clears throat> Don't you just love how God is after the heart and ask questions to get to the issue? What does this angel of the Lord say? Where have you come from? Where are you going? In essence, what happened? Where are you at? Where are you going to? I love when Jesus was with the woman at the well. <laughs> And he said, go and call your husband. To which she replied, I have no husband. To which Jesus said, you said well. You don't have one, you have five. And the one that you're living with is not yours. Jesus, in essence, is bringing these questions to the surface. Because he wants to get to our heart. She said, I'm, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. I mean, she's really in a pickle. If anyone had the place to say, hey, this man wronged me, I don't want anything to do with God, it would have been Hagar. 
And I can't tell you how many people I talk with just about Christianity in general, but especially at the hospital, where when I ask them about where they're at with the Lord, typically they will start out by telling me about how a church person had hurt them or this church that they grew up had hurt them and they were judgmental and they had these wounds or I had my mom said this or my dad said that. And, and I would typically then ask questions about Jesus. And one of the things that I'm always amazed by is that I have yet in all of my years to hear somebody say they have a problem with Jesus. But they're not going to Jesus because of something that happened with somebody that claims Jesus. And if anybody had the right to do that, wouldn't it have been Hagar? If anybody could go, listen, I got really messed up by some godly people. It's Hagar, right? But what does Jesus do? As the angel of the Lord intercepts her and goes after her, passionately pursues her. How often do we take things out on God because of somebody that represents him wrong? Listen, I've got to be honest with you. I, I read this bro- book when I, early on in coming to Jesus, that said that this guy was talking about what it means to be born again. And he said, listen, when you look at the definition of what it means to be born again, and what a Christian's life should look like, he said 95% of the people that call themselves Christians, I believe, are not. So should it be any surprise that most people have these wounds from people that are claiming to be Christians that most likely are not? come in contact with very little people where I go, that person is a sold out believer for Jesus. And I think, just my guess, that most of the wounds that we see from the church are coming from people that aren't even in a relationship with Jesus. That are just claiming him kind of as life insurance. Because who wouldn't? In the United States, it's just what we do, right? If you want to get to heaven, you're, say you believe in Jesus. Who wouldn't want that? The problem is is that they've never been born again. Even in that, Abram has been accounted, it's been accounted to him for righteousness and he still messes up. And God passionately pursues Hagar, which is just incredible to me. Let's go, let's keep going. Verse nine, it says, then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the, the Lord had heard your affliction because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, I also, have I also here seen him who sees me. Therefore, the well was called Ber Laharoi. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Barad. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son who bore, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And before we go to our application, I just want to read that section for you in the NLT because I think it reads really neat. It says, The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness, along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarah's servant, Where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you're now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You will name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. The son of yours will be a wild man and untamed as wild as a donkey or as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Therefore, Hagar used the name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, 
You are the God who sees me. She also said, Have I truly seen the one who sees me? So let's pause there for a minute. What does Jesus counsel her to do? Go back and submit yourself to authority. Guys, I am telling you, I have struggled with that all week. It has made me really uncomfortable to think that that's the plan. That's the play. That is a really tough thing to try to wrap your head around. But here's what I know. God knows. He knew how this was all going to work out. He knew that this was the best thing at the time. And that's what he counseled her to do. Part of following God is submitting to him and knowing that he is going to work all of this out for his purposes. And I have to tell you, I've had to submit to this scripture this week. Sometimes it doesn't always make sense. Because if, if I was writing it, this chapter would not have gone as it, as it did. But it's interesting to look at her reply. She doesn't walk away going, these godly people, I'm never going to church. I don't even want to, I don't even want to hear Christian radio. I don't even want to hear about Chris Tomlin. You can keep your Christmas CD and Bible. Don't you invite me to church on Christmas either, right? It's typically what we hear with those that have been harmed. We don't hear that from her. Kindness of God brings us to repentance. What did she walk away saying? The name of her son is the God who hears. She renames the place where she was the God who sees. God hears Hagar. God sees Hagar. And even when you're in your mess, even when you go, I can't, I can't get out, I'm stuck. God hears you and he sees you. And he cares for you. He knows the hurts that you have. He knows the wounds that you have that you don't tell anybody else. He knows your struggles. He knows your pain. He knows the wounds that are so deep that you go, this will never get healed. He knows every single one of those things. And all of those God-sized problems that we have, God's the only one that has a God-sized solution for them. As we close, I want to take a couple parts of this chapter and just apply them to our lives. And I actually think there's probably 20 different things that you could apply. Isn't it wild how easy it is to apply our lives to failures in the scriptures? Right? Last week it was like, man, God makes us a promise, we accept it, and we believe. But does anybody else feel like, man, I, I, I actually relate to Abram, Sarai, and Hagar. Like, I've been there. Am I the only one? Let's go through these a little bit. Number one, these are just things that you can apply to your life. If you don't want to apply them, that's totally fine. We're still going to talk about them. First up, Abram. The thing that we learned about Abram is don't be passive. You can't. You can't sit back and just let somebody else come into your, your household, even if it's one of the members of your household. We as husbands, we're not going to be able to stay on our day of talking to the Lord and giving an account for our family and the spiritual health of our family. We're not going to be able to say, well, this was my wife's idea. And this was my five-year-old's idea. It's not how it goes. Husbands, you have to lead and you cannot let somebody come into your family and do something that gets you off course. You can't be passive. You don't always have to have all of the answers. But you have to be able to say no. What could he have said to his wife when she came? It's easier right now to look back and say it, right? He could have said, babe, let's sit down and let's talk about this. Honey, later on tonight, let's get some good food. And I want to talk about what, what you just brought to the table. Could have got some good food, set out a time, held her hands, looked her in the eye, and said, listen, God is faithful, and he's good, 
and He's not going to let us down. He's given us a promise to have a child. And right now, I know you think it's your fault. It's not. It's not your fault. Even if it was your fault, we're good. I'm going to be here with you through all of it. You are the most important earthly relationship that I have. You're my everything. You're my boo. I'm not going to bring somebody else into our bed. I'm not going to bring somebody else into our family. I made the mistake of going to Egypt. Hagar shouldn't even be here. That's my fault. Will you forgive me? Honey, we got this. We need to get our eyes back on Jesus. God, at that time, he probably would have said. He's good. He's going to lead us. I know that we're in the wilderness, literally. But I so respect that you have followed me here. I want to pray for you. Can you imagine what would have happened if he could have just redirected it, paused for a minute, and got her, got her eyes back on the Lord? Sarai, what can we say to her? What can we learn from her? Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. I mean, if we play this out, all she literally had to do was wait and continue to have intimacy with her husband. And this was going to happen. You go, but Ben, sometimes it's the hardest thing to do to wait. I mean, like, what does that practically look like? It practically looks like waiting. Anything else for Sarai at this point is, is wrong in terms of she just needs to hang close to her husband Keep doing husband and wife things, and it was going to happen. I, I know that there are so many issues where we look on and go, Lord, it isn't happening right now. Wait on the Lord. The answer may come totally different than you think, but wait on Him. Hagar. What do we learn about Hagar? Look how much God loves her. If you've been taken advantage of, bruised, broken, felt alone, remember that God saw Hagar and God sees and hears you. Hagar didn't walk away putting down Abram and Sarai. She walked away with new names about the Lord's faithfulness to her. Her son, this is a prophecy that came true. He became the head of the Arab nations. The Muslim faith goes directly back to Ishmael. Isn't that wild? That was a prophecy of our Lord Almighty that that would happen. So if you think you're going to stop it, you can't. It was a promise. You go, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I agree with that. That's okay. There's lots of things I disagreed with in this chapter. It's God's faithful promise to somebody, and he kept it. We're going to learn about that more in a couple weeks. What else do we learn from this chapter as we close? Sin and bad decisions have consequences, and you've got to take responsibility for them. When we make bad decisions, we need to know that there are not quick fixes and easy solutions. We live in a country, boy, we love quick solutions. We love a quick fix, don't we? I mean, for Pete's sake, look at our kitchens. How can I make this faster and quicker? Microwaves, air fryers. Come on. We're still waiting for that back to the future moment where we put a pizza in in 15 seconds. It's ready. It's not how it goes with the Lord. He does it the total opposite. The total opposite. God is in the long haul with us. Thousands of years he walked through this consequence. Right? And we as parents, when our kids mess up, we want to solve it like this. Let's get it taken care of, done, put it away. That is not the way that our Heavenly Father solves problems. 
He is willing to walk through consequences with us. And it doesn't mean that we get to just... One of the characteristics of being a Christian, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is long-suffering patience. We've got to get more comfortable with walking through some of these consequences that we've made. Not running away, but walking through them. I mean, just think about that in Romans 6, it says the wages of sin is death. That is a consequence to sin. Right in the garden, God didn't go, we're good. I'll take care of this real quick. Thousands of years. We'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> so sin and bad decisions have consequences. God's never in. He's never been after the quick fix. I mean, let's think about this. How would you play this out if you were the Lord? How would you have fixed this problem with Abram, Sarai, and Hagar? What would be your solution? Come on, we're all problem solvers, right? Well, you we could have done this, and you know, if we well, we could have brought in an, another godly man for Hagar, and we could have separated and um, that prophecy about uh, the Arab nations. Let's take that back because we don't want that because the Jews and the Arabs they always seem to fight, and you know, we don't want that, and so. That never would have been our solution, right? God's walked thousands of years through millions of mistakes. The consequences of sin are still present, and it shows you how long suffering God is. A couple more. God didn't give up on Abram and Sarai, He kept His promise, and He hasn't given up on you. What He said to Abram last week. He meant. He accounted it to him for righteousness. So last week when Abram looked on and said, Lord, I'm all in. God doesn't look on and go, I want you out. We're going to read next week. He comes back and he reassures. He starts digging back in with Abram. He's going to rename him. That shows us the type of God that we follow. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't say, I'm done with you. I can't believe you messed up. I can't believe that you said that this week. You know, I've been trying to reach all those people at your workplace and you went in and dropped an F-bomb. I can't believe you. How am I going to reach these people now? That's what we typically think the Lord's like with us, right? He's not. He is in passionate pursuit of us. He loves us. He wants to walk alongside of us. He wants us to give Him His problems. And so he didn't give up on Hagar, he didn't give up on Sarai, he didn't give up on Abram, and he hasn't given up on you. God cared for the single pregnant woman, so should we. I would like to think that if Abram came to Calvary Chapel Tiffin, she would be welcomed with open arms. That we would go up and talk to her and say, we're so glad you're here. When are you due? That baby's a blessing. That's amazing. You know, God's got a plan for that baby. Can I pray over you? So glad you're here. That's what I hope that she would get if she came here. See, in our society, I think we do the total opposite. And that's why we drive women to go make terrible decisions. Because we've brought so much shame. But if we could be the ones that embrace and accept... Be incredible the impact that we would have. Lastly, God solved God sized problems with God sized solutions. How does He solve this problem with Abram and Sarai? Well, first, as we'll read in the next upcoming week, He waits until Sarai is at the point of physically impossible to have kids. To where you go, this well is dry. He gets to a point where it's impossible for her, and then he says, now it's time. Now it's time to answer this prayer. Now it's time to do the miracle. Now it's time to fulfill my promise. 
That's a God-sized solution that only He could do. Second, you don't want to solve a God-sized problem with a fleshly solution. You're not going to come up with a better answer. You can't. And so if you're sitting around thinking about all the problems that you have, whether they're financial or relational, maybe you have a relationship that's strained, or you go, boy, we're in so much debt. We're, we're like, I mean, it, we're broke. There's no way out of this. How would you solve it? So many times we look on it and we go, well, if I got this credit card, if I financed it this way, or if I did this, and I, maybe it's a God-sized solution. It's the only way out. You go, what do I do until then? Seek the Lord. Spend time with Him. Get into His Word. Spend more time with Jesus than you do with anybody else because that's who you need to hear from right now. (coughs) Lastly, understand that the greatest God-sized problem of all time, which is death, was solved by a God-sized solution. This whole thing with Abram and Sarah, it points to the greatest God problem of all time, and that's what happened in the garden. Death. This is the the, the biggest problem we think of, right? Ten out of ten of us in this room are going to die. We can't get out of it. And that is a consequence of the very first sin in the garden. And we always try to find a human solution, don't we? A fleshly solution. We come up with all kinds of You drink from this waterfall and you'll have eternal life. If you're a good person, you'll have eternal life. If your good outweighs your bad, you'll have eternal life. If you grow up in this church, you'll have eternal life. That's not a God-sized solution. Those are things that are easy. I can remember before I was a Christian, um, I thought I was a Christian. I grew up in a Methodist church and thought that I had done everything right because I had went through confirmation, but what I really believed was when I got before the judgment seat, if I had gotten anything wrong, Jesus would say to me, do you believe me now? And then I would get ushered in. That is nowhere in the scriptures. God's solution to death and separation from Him in the garden was thousands of years worth of a solution see, when Adam and Eve fell and they got separated from God, he came up with this plan to get humans back together with him. And he started with a family. And they would give birth to a nation. And that nation would give birth to a Messiah. That Messiah would would live a perfect and a sinless life and die a brutal, brutal death that he didn't deserve. But he would become this sinless sacrifice for all mankind. He would die on a cross, but He would rise again. And then He would make an open invitation to all people from here on out. And the way that He said, you can come back into a relationship with Me, is being born again. You go, well, what does that mean? That means you've got to give your life over to Him, just like a human being is born physically. You have to go through this spiritual birth. And if you look on and say, you know, I... Uh, I was my grandparents and my parents were Christians. That's not in John chapter three when Jesus is talking about how to have a relationship with Him. The God-sized solution is you have to look on to Jesus and you have to say, "I'm in. I am all in." Paul would later go on and say, "If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you'll be saved." And so the question isn't, "Is my?" fleshly solution to death going to work. It's, have you given your life to Jesus? Because that is God's solution to this terrible thing that we've been dealing with for all man, for all mankind. So listen, when it comes to you, here's where we'll close today. Have you done that? When it comes to salvation, when it comes to Judgment Day, if today was the day, are you counting on your solution Or are you counting on Jesus' solution? Because if you come to the judgment seat and you go, I did this, well, I went to confirmation, or I did that, that's a human solution. That's just like drinking from a fountain that says gives eternal life. It's man's way of trying to solve a problem. The only thing that we can say is, 
On April 17, 2011, I confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I followed Him. Come in. That's the only way that we can be saved. That's how we get get account into righteousness. And so listen, I don't know if you've ever done that before, if you've never made that decision before, but how we'll close is I'm going to end us in prayer, and if you have never made that step to make take a, a God-sized solution to death, then come on up, we can pray together, we can get that sorted out, but don't leave here today thinking, I've got it all together. I'll pray with us, and then we'll, we'll get out of here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together today. Thank you for Genesis 16. Thank you for the work that you did with Abram, Sarai, and Hagar, and Ishmael. Although this is a very painful chapter to read, it is such a good one, Lord. Thank you that you didn't hide this chapter. You didn't just go right from 15 to 17. You put this right in here to show us, number one, that you don't give up on Abram. You didn't give up on Sarai. And how much you love Hagar. So thank you for reminding us of that today. God, I pray for each one of us here. I pray that each one of us will have taken that step to accept a godly solution to a God-sized problem. I pray that you would give us all boldness. If we need to make things right with you today, I pray that you would make us bold to come up and pray and to not leave today with all of these problems not being dealt with. And so we're thankful for this time. We pray that you would embolden us as we leave. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.